I present to you for the award of the degree of Doctor of Science, Honoris Causa, Professor Ottiline Leiser. Since 2013, Professor Leiser has been director of the Sainsbury Laboratory at the University of Cambridge, a post, a post she holds alongside her professorship of plant development and a fellowship at Clare College. She obtained her biological training at the University of Cambridge, and this was followed by postdoctoral and academic appointments at Indiana, Cambridge, and York Universities. Professor Dame Ottiline Leiser is a world leading developmental plant biologist. She has conducted highly influential work on the hormonal regulation of plant development, and in particular, how hormones control the architecture of the plant shoot. Her research subject of choice has been Arabidopsis thaliana, a relative of the cabbage, and famously the first plant to have had its entire genome sequenced. Professor Leiser has played a fundamental role in promoting use of Arabidopsis as a key model organism in modern biology and has provided leadership to the Arabidopsis research community. In recognition of this role, she is currently chair of the British Society for Developmental Biology and has served as editor-in-chief of several of the leading journals in the field. Professor Leiser's distinctions have been recognized by numerous honors. She received the President's Medal of the Society of Experimental Biology in 2000, the Royal Society's Rosalind Franklin Award in 2007, the Silver Medal from the International Plant Growth Substance Association in 2010, and the UK Genetic Society Medal in 2016. She was appointed a Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire in the 2017 New Year's Honours List. She is a Fellow of the Royal Society, a Foreign Associate of the US National Academy of Sciences, and a member of the European Molecular Biology Organization and of the German Academy of Sciences, Leopoldina. The citations for these honors frequently draw attention not only to Professor Leiser's distinction as a scientist, but also to her service to science policy and wider society and her ad advocacy for equality and diversity in science. For example, she has been a member of the Nuffield Council on Bioethics and chaired its Bioethics Research Culture Report. Professor Leiser chairs the Royal Society's Science Policy Expert Advisory Committee and also serves on the Council for Science and Technology. Her involvement with the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council is long-standing and includes a term as chair of the Bioscience Skills and Careers Strategy Panel and two terms on the Strategy Board. Her policy and political engagement has included several appearances as a witness before parliamentary select committees and other public groups. Beyond the laboratory in the committee room, Professor Leiser is a leading advocate and role model for equality and diversity in science. In 2008, she published a book of biographical sketches of 64 female scientists who have combined a successful scientific career with motherhood, including Neva Hates, Professor Emeritus of this university. In 2016, in the forewords to a policy document published by the Royal Society with the title Parent Carer Scientist, Professor Leiser wrote that Research needs diversity, and diversity means diverse people living diverse lives with diverse approaches and diverse experiences. Her own life and career serves as an inspiring illustration of the truth of these principles. Pro Chancellor, in recognition of her unique and outstanding contributions to plant developmental biology and for her service to science in society, and equality and diversity in science, it is my pleasure to invite you to confer on Professor Dame Ottiline Leiser the degree of Doctor of Science, Honoris Causa. Ego te scientiae doctorem magistrum constituo creo proclamare renuncio 
et in signum caput tuum hoc pilio orno quod ut felix pastunque sit deum optimum maximum precor. Don't worry, it's very big writing. <laughs> so first of all, I'd like to move the microphones because, as usual, they're too high up for me. Second of all, <laughs> I would like to thank everybody here for this wonderful honor of an honorary doctorate. It's um, really a, an honor and a pleasure to receive it, and particularly so to be able to share um, vicariously with all of you in your amazing successes and um, triumphs as you graduate today. And I would like to add my congratulations to no doubt the many congratulations you have and, and will receive on your um, <coughs> hard-earned degrees. I think these kinds of ceremonies, they're always a wonderful thing. They're a kind of milestone that mark one set of achievements, but also mark the beginning of the very next things that you're planning to do. And whatever it is that you're planning to do, I hope very much that you find the things that you've done at university to be useful and, and valuable in, in, as you move forward. And it's easy to think about that in the first instance in, in the context of what you've learned, in the knowledge that you've acquired on your various degree programs. But uh, actually, I think the knowledge itself is, is really almost, almost the least of it. It'll be important. I'm sure it'll be useful. But just that knowledge is really not enough. What you need is the knowledge, but also, hopefully, in your studies, you've learned something about how that knowledge fits in to the bigger picture. You've learned its strengths and its weaknesses. You've learned the evidence that underpins that knowledge, and therefore, the power of that knowledge, but also its limitations. And through all this, you've learned, I hope, how to use that knowledge wisely. I think this is extraordinarily important, and I think it's that place of your knowledge in the wider firmament that is almost more valuable than the knowledge itself. So I hope that's been very much at the heart of your university life, and I can maybe illustrate this with maybe a dangerous question that's going to call for a small amount of audience participation. So. How many people are sitting here, maybe you people over here in particular, but actually maybe everybody, how many people are sitting here because at some point in their lives they have answered a question that either began or ended with the word discuss? <laughs> Hands up. Excellent. I like discuss questions. I, I um, typically set discuss questions myself. I like discuss questions because they don't have a right answer. And in fact, if you ask me, all the interesting questions in life are discuss questions. The questions that have a correct answer, um, that they're, <laughs> they're done. <laughs> the questions that don't have a correct answer, either we don't know what the answer is yet, and I, it, I'm sure some of you have been beavering away at research to try to answer some of those as yet unanswered questions. But actually, the big questions in life, I don't think, will ever have a correct answer. Should the UK be in the European Union? Discuss. <laughs> Should Scotland be part of the United Kingdom? Discuss. How can we best decarbonize the electricity supply? Discuss. Under what circumstances should we use genome editing technology? Discuss. Are five-part lists more rhetorically effective than three-part lists? Discuss. So these are all 
important questions with the possible exception of the last one, which nonetheless some people might think is an important question. But they're very important questions and none of them have a correct answer. All of them, all of them require the kind of knowledge you've been learning. All of them need that kind of, of expertise, but all of them need for you to understand the power and limitations of that knowledge as I've already described, but all of them also need to wrap in to your considerations of the discussion all kinds of other very important things. Your personal values, the balancing of the priorities of different kinds of people, and of course, uncertainty, how you factor in both past, present, and future unknowns into making these very difficult decisions. They're quite often binary decisions, but there is no correct answer. All of them, all of those questions, to answer them well or to find good answers, the best answers, they need really high quality discussion. And if you ask me, that's the thing we're most short of at the moment in the kinds of debates we've been listening to in the news that were referred to in the very excellent poem that opened this ceremony. There hasn't been enough really high quality discussion. There have been people saying what they think, but there hasn't been discussion. For high quality, inclusive, engaged discussion, you need diversity, as was also mentioned. You need diverse participants, all of them listening very carefully to each other, and because they disagree, it's that very disagreement that fuels the discussion in a constructive and positive way. And so people have to come to those discussions recognizing that disagreement and differences need to be deeply understood to be able to capture the value of that diversity and move forward to make high quality decisions through that open, engaged, deeply understanding and respectful discussion. And without that kind of mutual understanding that we need to bring together from across the diverse communities that are important in all these decisions, it will not be possible to find the most effective solutions to these kinds of complex problems. We have to replace the kind of polemic that we see everywhere in the media, in the um, political realm, with actual proper discussion. And to me, that's actually what diversity and inclusion are about. It means committing to engaging with difference, real difference. It's actually very difficult because it almost inevitably involves people disagreeing with you and nobody likes to be disagreed with. But actually for me, um, being disagreed with is actually one of the most interesting things. That's the only way you're going to learn. And I think one of the most important things a university can do, and hopefully that a university education has brought to you, is the ability to engage in that very positive way with disagreement. Universities should provide an environment that support their staff and students to engage deeply and constructively with difference, with, with dissent, with divergence, with diversity in all its kinds of forms. Diversity inclusion is not about counting minorities. It's not about checking up. You've, you've ticked some kind of uh, um, quota. It's about genuinely valuing difference. And the reason to genuinely value difference is because difference is genuinely valuable and powerful, and we need it to tackle the kinds of problems that I've mentioned already. So uh, Michael Gove, very famously during the Brexit referendum, um, said that we were all sick of experts. And a lot of people leapt on this and um, ridiculed him for um, making such a kind of outrageously stupid comment on the face of it. And they um, leapt on this uh, comment as a kind of symptom of the so-called post-truth society when nobody cares about um, facts anymore. Uh, and those who were perhaps more sympathetic to his views on Brexit um, pointed out that actually he wasn't really uh, being quoted very uh, accurately by just saying he was sick of experts because what he actually said was he was sick of experts saying that they know what's best. To me, that is not an expert. An expert when facing one of these complex questions is never going to say what's best. A person who will tell you what's best, will tell you the definitive solution to a complex problem is just an insecure person trying to cover up their fear of the unknown with misplaced certainty. Be, be suspicious of certainty because you, as true experts in your field, know that an expert is open-minded and understands the level of uncertainty associated with their opinion and also they understand that the specialist knowledge that they have is only one piece 
of a complex puzzle and they need to combine it and listen it and listen to and tension it against the evidence of, of other um, stakeholders in the decision. So in the Brexit debate, in my opinion, there have not been enough experts of that sort who were truly listening. Opinions were stated, but they were not discussed. In fact, one of the things you can get the widest agreement on in the entire mess is that there hasn't been enough high quality discussion. And I really hope that what those finals exams where you were discussing a whole variety of things have helped you to do and what your experience at university in general have helped you to do is to bring that open-minded, engaged discussion where you look somebody in the eye who disagrees with you and smile and say, that's really interesting, please explain to me more what you mean by that because I disagree and that's an interesting point of starting for a high quality engaged discussion. So I'd like to congratulate you again on your wonderful achievements and I hope very much that you have wonderful futures full of engaged and constructive discussion. Thank you very much. Well, it's obviously a huge honour, and I very much enjoyed the ceremony. I think they're wonderful things to mark these really important events in people's lives. I think graduation is, a, is one of those events, and it's great to be able to join in the celebrations. Well, I think it, it's a very exciting time in the world at the moment. There are um, a lot of very major problems that need addressing, but also there are a huge number of opportunities to address them. So I wish them all the best in picking something to do that they enjoy, but also that's worthwhile and fulfilling. Oh wow, <laughs> that was a long time ago. I really enjoyed my undergraduate um, course. It, it was just full of very exciting, interesting people and very exciting, interesting science. And I, 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 when people ask me about my career, I quite often say that I went to university and I never left, which is essentially true. And it's been wonderful having the opportunity to work with so many interesting people over the years.